And if you laugh, they might the, actually publish a second book. <laughs> that, that, that's it, that's great. <laughs> we were being treated to these opinion pieces and articles regularly after the Arab uprising started. Is the Arab world ready for democracy? Why Western democracy can never work in the Middle East? Why Arab democracy will fail? And then it started to get a bit esoteric, you know. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a girl really intrigued by the emerging punditry about the region and, uh, you know, the people who take it upon themselves to kind of explain what the Middle East is about. Um, and obviously then you get... <laughs> You get someone like Thomas Friedman. Um, Syria is Iraq. I don't know why he bothered writing the rest of the article. <laughs> someone who actually I'd respected for his work about Lebanon, uh, historically, which is Robert Fisk. Um, but then again, even him, during you know, 2011, 2012, started to become like really surreal. So this, this is one of my favorite pieces, which is, uh, um, Robert Fisk, President Morsi, a red ballot, and a fox's tail that has all of Cairo a buzz. And I just want to attract your attention to this first sentence over here. There is a fox in Tahrir Square, bushy-tailed and thickly furred. And you like, you wonder, like, am I reading Moliere or is it Galila <laughs> Wadumna? So, so that's when I wrote one of my first satirical pieces, Robert Fisk, reporting from Syria with sensational quotes in the headlines. Our writer reports from the frontiers of his fertile imagination. As I got in the car, the driver smiled and nodded wisely. As all taxi drivers in the Middle East do when they're driving a foreign journalist around. Ahead lay a deceptively, deceptively empty stretch of road that my imagination quickly filled with the mental image of Sargon II's soldiers marching along, primarily to illustrate my excellent knowledge of history. The man back at the hotel had warned me about the false tranquility of this part of Aleppo that I was about to visit. He only identified himself as the Raven. But something told me that I must trust this man, dressed strangely in a abaya made of black feathers, despite the searing heat. I have stopped long ago questioning those mysterious men I encounter while reporting in the Middle East. And so too have my editors. Back on the road, the driver slowed then took a turn between two huge rocks that resembled a lion about to brush its teeth. As he sped past, I glimpsed a seven-year-old child in a green and white t-shirt being hurried along by his worried mother and her brother-in-law's cousin who had recently come back from Canada. As usual, I will end with a completely irrelevant question that has nothing to do with the rest of the article and that leaves you even more baffled. Could it be that the current conflict is the logical outcome of Alembi's reluctance to engage the local chieftains? Did Gig Fansal make a fatal mistake in the summer of 1932? What is really the point of those open-ended questions? Could they be a useful way to imply that I'm a world weary and have seen too much? It's kind of two or three years into the Arab uprising, it's, it's, it's kind of, you observe this thing that there's the cyclical waves of articles that suggest the solution to everything is always to either partition a country or jo join two countries together or somehow generally do some form of redecoration in the Middle East. From there on, you know, from this, uh, from this series of observations was born um, the now world-famous Institute of Internet Diagrams. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO. And we started to branch out 
and this particular one uh, for which we did a lot of thorough research came out of the observation that the better the food in a country, the worse the government. So you can see as the governance index goes up, the quality of food deteriorates and you get a country like Lebanon where the food is great but the government is I'll just draw your attention to Egypt, which is an outlier. <laughs> you know, my work in explainers came into this notion that, uh, especially with the rise of ISIS, I observed that, well, kind of external, you know, Western pundits and other people, when they try to explain ISIS, it always had to be one thing, it had to be very simple. Like you couldn't have two reasons, right? So whatever your pet cause is, that's what caused ISIS. It's climate change caused ISIS, inequality caused ISIS, the Iraqi government caused ISIS. From there on, as, as a kind of uniquely placed individual in Europe, I thought, you know, I'm, I could be a bridge builder. Right. I, so then I started to develop this Lewina Studies program, you know, Western Europe and North America. <laughs> or Europe and the Middle East. We're like the Rachel and Ross of geopolitical history. <laughs> and, and all the Wiener is about is an attempt to kind of bring our cultures together. And you'll see where I've taken that uh, in my work. Um, as well for the EU referendum, which many people don't understand that the real reasons for what happened in 2016 is the ancient hatreds between the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> then, I, then I started looking at another aspect of Middle East representation, which is um, photography. And um, I was really fascinated by these series of photographs about places like Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, um, their attention to the details of every lay life. I was so mesmerized by that, you know, like two women in a cafe, a man and a woman on the street. It's, it's phenomenal kind of, it, it, it genuinely, they deserve to be collected and published in their own. A woman writing on a blackboard. I mean, I was genuinely inspired. So I thought, how, how could I reciprocate, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a long time to master, you know, the art of photography enough to um, you know, pay attention to these every details. Much like us, Westerners work in offices and other places of employment. Sadly, they also have to attend meetings and pretend they are interested. When Western people's hair grows, they need a haircut, just like us. They go to get a haircut and often engage in conversations with the hairdresser. I, I realized after I took this picture that I was standing really close to this couple. <laughs> and, and this is one of my favorites, you know. Uh, Western people, they just go to cafes just like us, just like us. Two things happened, obviously, that altered the path of my um, satirical career. Um, the first thing that happened was obviously Brexit. I was genuinely, in the aftermath of Brexit, I was I was seeing this division uh, in society. You know, the country is split 50-50. People hate each other. They can't get together. They can't agree on anything. And as a Lebanese person, I'm really not used to that. 
and I was really worried, you know. I said, I really want to help. I really want to help. Britain has given me so much. How can I help? She maybe like organize a concert in Beirut. <laughs> with a fundraiser. And bring in maybe six children from a Remain background and six children from a leave background. <laughs> and come up with a song that teaches them about respect and peace and getting along together. And I said, no, 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 that's not it, that's not it. Should, should we organize a series of workshops about peace building, and bridge building, where we bring again leavers and remainers take them, I don't know, to Cairo or Tunisia. <laughs> and we do some training sessions. And, and I was coming with, up with all these ideas because I really wanted to help. And I thought, you know what? I'm approaching this all the wrong way, right? What would the UK have done in a situation like this? <laughs> and clearly, we had to split the UK. Right? And... <laughs> I mean, it's genuinely what Britain would have done, right? And we were only being... paying back the favor. And subsequently, I decided I think Libya wasn't the right name, so I think Brexitania and Romania would be the names of the two countries. And then I went as far as... No? <laughs> Maybe we have like a Berlin Wall down Trafalgar Square, and then you'd have, uh, I, I don't know, which side would we leave? Um, difficult. So leave on one side, remain on the other. Um, we, we have to keep them apart, obviously, because if Western punditry and commentary about the Middle East has taught us anything, is borders solve everything, and <laughs> dividing countries always makes things better. Then I thought, let's actually draw them up. Uh, and yeah, I, a lot of people argued me. I did this before the actual uh, results came out. And a lot of people are arguing with me, were like, which, which side was on which side? And I'm like, you're missing the point. <laughs> Britain never paid attention to these realities on the ground. And I realized by using, you know, the terminology that we use to describe the Middle East, we can really describe everything that's happening over there. So we have an outgoing president, regime media, president-elect, rural strongholds. And these are some meaningless graphs and <laughs> images to make it look more professional. And in all of these efforts, you know, I genuinely was trying to help. I genuinely wanted to help the West and make it a better place. But I tried and I tried and I tried. And I think ultimately I failed. And the conclusion that I arrived at was 